Hi, and welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Social Studies Academy, where we are finally back picking up with our U.S. History series. And today we're going to do part one of Western Expansion from 1865 to about 1900 and the quote-unquote Native American experience. For those of you who completed our early U.S. history course, we covered Manifest Destiny, events like the Mexican-American War, the California Gold Rush starting in 1849, and all of these provide context. Remember, context is what led up to that event. Provide context for the second wave of migration following the Civil War. And we will take a closer look at the Homestead Act, as this is usually on your test as one of the major governmental incentives for Western expansion in the second half of the 19th century. For dates, we are talking about 1870 to 1900s, and we're talking about millions of acres up for grabs. But could you handle settling out west? So while this series was designed for students taking the Florida EOC U.S. History exam, most tested benchmarks are pretty standard for this era. Whether you're taking another state exam or AP U.S. History or you just want to be here to learn U.S. History, you're in the right place. So again, we talked about Western migration in our first series, such as the San Francisco 49ers. No, not the football team. Those who caught gold fever and headed for the region ultimately creating one of America's most unique cities. And the miners, the gold miners, that is, will continue to play a role in Western expansion. But today, we aren't going to be looking back at those headed up the Oregon Territory and stuff like that. This is about the second wave of migration after the Civil War and the transformative effects it would have on U.S. history. Throughout this U.S. history course, we have continually looked at conflicts between the European settlers and the native or indigenous population. And this concept of the quote-unquote frontier, this area between parts that have been settled by Europeans and the Native Americans, and throughout most of our course, that frontier had kept spreading westward. And with that westward spread, unfortunately for the indigenous population, a.k.a. Native Americans, the frontier in the 1860s and 1870s had closed in on them, consisting mostly of the Plains regions. The Great Plains at this point were mostly treeless grasslands, not ideal land to settle. The Plains were home to a variety of native tribes, the Lakota Sioux, a tribe we will come back to, or the Comanche, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and often these tribes were broken into sub-tribe so, yes, by the 1870s, this truly was America's last frontier. The problem for those tribes native to this land is that Congress and business interests had other plans for the region. And by the looks of that map, you can probably tell what it is. So, westward expansion. What would motivate a person, a family, a group, enough to make this incredibly dangerous and difficult journey west? And one of the things we covered in Manifest Destiny are what are called, quote-unquote, push and pull factors. They're pretty much the same things in the 1870s as they were in the 1840s. They usually involved either money or a desire and sometimes even a need to get away from the East Coast. A push factor would be like in the 1840s when my Irish ancestors emigrated to America only to find that they weren't welcome. Now, many Irish men would go on to help build the first transcontinental railroad out west. But other things like overcrowding, lack of opportunities, especially for immigrants. And while immigration paused during the Civil War, between 1870 and 1900, America would see the largest number of immigrants enter the country. And some of this wave were not really welcomed, and they were either pushed or pulled out west. Others, like the Mormons, were pushed west to escape religious persecution and eventually settled in Salt Lake City, Utah in the 1840s. There were also what were referred to as the Exodusters, those who ventured into the territories to escape racial discrimination in former Confederate states and search for a freedom and a land of their own. 
These African Americans often landed in Kansas, and now we'll be covering later in this course what's referred to as the Great Migration, so don't get confused with that, but these exodusters did play a small but brave segment in the expansion of the West. A pull factor, well, we'll look at a big one in more detail with the Homestead Act, which is often on your test. But in addition to Freeland, gold miners and former Civil War soldiers, those pooled by the lure to make it rich and enticement of financial rewards were among the pull factors for many who made the journey. So we touched on the Homestead Act of 1862, passed during the Civil War, as one of those laws pushed through by Northern Republicans in the hopes of spurring economic development, which would mostly benefit the industrial North. Now, this act granted 160 free acres of land to anyone who agreed to farm it. Problem is, you had to live on it for five years. These people, often known as quote-unquote sodbusters, their life could be incredibly lonely, the farming difficult, building houses out of mud bricks. And we're going to be looking closer in our next lesson at the agricultural experience of this era. But for many, the lifelong dream of owning land attracted more than just Americans, and the risk to them was worth the reward. We also talked about the miners who ventured west well after the San Francisco gold rush because the rivers in San Francisco by then had pretty much been run dry of gold by the miners. And they will seek out new locations that we'll look at later like Colorado and Idaho. Boom towns popped up throughout the west whenever a big deposit of gold or silver was discovered. And as soon as that deposit had been mined, ghost towns would haunt the landscape of the West. Now, most would be developed at a later date, but there's still a few out there that you can see. We also covered how Congress, with the signature of Abraham Lincoln, created a series of laws collectively known as the Pacific Railroad Acts to spur economic development. Now, we will come back to the railroad multiple times. Again, in our next lesson, it'll be the railroad versus the farmers. But for now, the, the Transcontinental Railroad would finally connect America from coast to coast, dramatic decreasing the travel time to the West. The completion of the first Transcontinental Railroad was celebrated with a golden spike as the Central and Union Pacific Railroads met in Promontory Point, Utah in 1869, and it was celebrated across the nation and even heard about over in Europe. Now, we will be looking at the incredible economic impact of being able to ship large amounts of goods and people over vast distances. But this was just the beginning of a massive railroad system that would be developed as business interests saw the huge financial potential of the railroad exemplified on an upcoming lecture on the Gilded Age. However, not all were celebrating the arrival of the railroad. Yes, back to what was referred to on numerous occasions as the quote-unquote Indian problem, a phrase that dates back to President George Washington. And what policy would the government take with heavy economic and political pressure on them? They implemented a policy of relocation. Some historians would say dislocation or the removal of their land. And the concept of owning land, remember that this was kind of foreign to many indigenous native cultures. Of course, for context, remember that relocation or the removal of native tribes was not a new federal government policy by 1860 or 1870. We covered another quote-unquote Indian problem. I know I'm doing a lot of quote-unquotes, but hey, if it's in quotes, it's probably something you need to know. Anyway, we learned about the Indian Removal Act of 1830 during the age of Andrew Jackson, leading to what historians refer to as the Trail of Tears. Tens of thousands of natives died in a treacherous force relocation to Oklahoma from places like Georgia and Alabama, Mississippi. And this leads to our must-know reservation. <laughs> Let's see there, it's in quotes. Whatever. Anyway, the reservation practice dates back on this continent to the Royal Proclamation following the French and Indian War. The U.S. government and the native population have been making treaty after treaty, and it's almost always over land, since the founding of the United States. And the outcome always ended up with the natives agreeing to occupy a certain area, a.k.a. reservations. As the Midwest became settled, the Plains tribes were ultimately forced onto reservations, 
But some would not go without a fight, which is the final segment we'll look at, resistance to the reservation system. And the stage for this violence that we'll look at in part two was set up in 1864, when Union troops, remember the Civil War was still going on, slaughtered mostly Cheyenne women and children, sadly the men were off hunting, and the army killing hundreds of innocent Native Americans. And we are going to see that resistance grow, and this seems like a good place to take a break because what follows is intense and represents the attempts of the last of the Native tribes at resistance. And sadly, a lot of the violent moments that took place leading up to that is attempts by the natives to stop the closure of the final frontier. And that's what we'll pick up next time. So make sure to subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you back here. Thanks again.